started. Um, hi everyone and welcome to the fifth and final in um, session in this series of disability benefits workshops with Lupus UK. Today we'll be discussing how to apply for a blue badge. My name is Zulika Lebeau and to describe myself for anyone listening, I'm a white presenting mixed race woman with um, lots of curly red hair that's currently in a bun on top of my head. I'm wearing um, a blue stripy shirt and blue earrings, and I'm in front of an overstacked white bookshelf. Um, I'm the founder of Chronic Creatives, a platform dedicated to supporting artists who are chronically ill or disabled. And we've been working with Lupus UK to bring you these workshops um, that have been taking place over the last few weeks. I'm joined today by Louise Galinsky, who is a member of Chronic Creatives, a disability benefits expert, and who will be delivering the talk today. Louise, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Zulika. Hi, I'm Louise. For those of you listening, I'm in my late 60s. I have short white hair with some colour in it. I'm wearing um, a maroon T-shirt and a green gilet over it. And my background is a beautiful grey filing cabinet. I've been a solicitor for 38 years and for 24 of those years, I've specialised in disability benefits. Um, I'm a member of Chronic Creatives and um, today I somehow managed to wrench my left arm getting out of bed, uh, which is extremely painful. I can hardly move it. So if I'm a bit off at any time, that's what it's about. Thank you so much, Louise. I really appreciate you being here today, despite the fact that you're in so much pain. I'm sure everyone who is in attendance today is really grateful for that. A um, couple of housekeeping things. This session is being recorded, just to remind everybody. So please keep your cameras off and um, feel free to um, change your names if you would like that as well. There will be a Q&A after the session as Chanpreet has very kindly put in the chat. Um, please try to ask questions in the chat um, if you can, just again for anonymity. If you would like to ask a question um, and you think it's better to speak, just be mindful um, that this session is being recorded and that um, to keep out any sort of identifying um, features when you are speaking. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to get into the presentation. Please bear with me while I bring it up. Um, that says disability living allowance. Whoops, I had the, uh, there we go, had the wrong one up. Sorry folks, bear with. Okay, let's try this again, shall we? Right, so here we are today, applying for a blue badge. Next slide, please. This is uh, the contents page of what I'm going to be talking about. What is a blue badge? Eligibility, what you need to do to apply, filling in the form, the assessment, what to do if your application is refused, general tips, and then finally, some resources which you can use to help to, for help. Next slide, please. The blue badge scheme enables you to park closer to your destination if you're disabled or have a health condition. It enables you to park free of charge in bays that are reserved for blue badge holders hourly paid and in certain circumstances on single and double yellow lines. B 
beware, this doesn't mean that you can park on any single or double yellow line. If there are loading bay signs or yellow stripes on the curb, you cannot park there, as I have found to my cost. It usually doesn't permit you to park in a residence parking bay. However, it's worth checking the rules in the, any local authority you'll be visiting, as this varies from borough to borough. For example, in my local authority, which is Haringey, I recently found out that I am allowed to park in residence parking bays with a blue badge. So contrary to public opinion, the blue badge does not allow you to park anywhere. It does not allow you to park there for as long as you like either. So when you get your blue badge, as I hope you'll be successful in doing, having attended this talk, read the booklet that comes with it very carefully because that tells you where you can and cannot park. You can't park in a bus lane and you can't park at a bus stop. So there are more restrictions than you would think, but it does still enable you to park free of charge in more places than if you don't have one. Next slide, please. These are people who will automatically get a blue badge. <coughs> if you or your child receive the higher rate of the mobility component of disability living allowance, DLA, if you receive a personal independence payment or PIP because you cannot walk more than 50 metres, a score of eight points or more for moving around. If you are registered, registered blind or are severely sight impaired, if you receive a war pensioners mobility supplements, and also if you have obtained at least 10 points under the mobility component of PIP for needing help to plan and follow a journey on the grounds that you're unable to undertake any journey alone because it would cause you overwhelming psychological distress. This recognises that people need to park near to their destination, not just because of physical problems. For the first time, the blue badge is recognising that those with learning difficulties and or enduring mental health problems also qualify, but you do need 10 points um, or for planning and following a journey under PIP or eight points for the moving around, the problems with physical uh, walking part of PIP. Next slide, please. However, even if you don't automatically qualify, you may still be eligible if you can't walk at all, if you cannot walk without help from someone else or using mobility aids. Although I would have thought that people who come under nearly all of these categories on this slide should be in receipt of PIP. So if this applies to you, but you haven't applied to PIP, then you should be applying. If you find walking very difficult due to pain, breathlessness, or the time it takes. So that would cover people with severe asthma, for example. If walking is dangerous to your health and safety. If you have a terminal illness, which means you cannot walk or find walking very difficult and have a DS1500 form. The DS1500 form will be issued by your hospital <clears throat> and is issued to let uh, those in charge of your health, such as your GP, uh, know what is wrong with you and that you have a terminal illness. If you have a severe disability in both arms and drive, probably with um, an adapted vehicle, but cannot operate pay and display parking machines. This may seem a bit old hat in London where it's nearly all done by phone, but in other parts of the country, there are still pay and display machines. If you have a child under three with a medical condition, that means the child always needs to be accompanied by bulky medical equipment, such as an oxygen tank. 
The significance of the child being under the age of three is that if you're applying for DLA for your child, uh, you won't get the higher rate of the mobility component until that child is at least three years old. Next slide, please. Again, if you have a child under three with a medical condition, that means the child must always be kept near a vehicle in case they need emergency medical treatment. For example, if your child has a severe allergy and uh, you need to be able to take them to hospital quickly if they go into anaphylactic shock. Um, again, this, the significance of the age of three is the same, that under the age of three, you won't get the higher rate of the mobility components. If you are a significant risk to yourself or others near vehicles, in traffic or car parks, e.g. you have no awareness of danger near traffic or vehicles. This would apply to someone, say, with severe autism who has no road sense and may be nonverbal. But again, if you, uh, if you are or if you know someone who comes into that category, they should be in receipt of PIP. You struggle severely to plan or follow a journey. This may be as a result of brain damage, cognitive problems or severe depression. You find it difficult or impossible to control your actions and lack awareness of the impact you could have on others. This again would apply to people with severe autism or to someone say with Tourette syndrome. You regularly have intense and overwhelming responses to situations causing temporary loss of behavioral control. This may apply to someone with severe anxiety who suffers panic attacks and in the middle of a panic attack, they're unaware of their behavior. And that also applies to the last one you frequently become extremely anxious or fearful of public or open spaces. That may be similarly if you suffer from agoraphobia. But again, if you come into any of these categories, you should be applying for a disability benefit. Next slide, please. To apply for a blue badge, you'll need to provide proof of identity passport, driving license, preferably a photo card, but it doesn't have to be a photo card. Proof of address, council tax, pay slip, bills. A recent head and shoulders digital photo. Your national insurance number or NINO, if you have one, most adults of working age do have a NINO. And your contact details phone number, email, and postal address. Next slide, please. You will apply for a blue badge online via gov.uk. You cannot apply for it elsewhere. The form will ask you for your personal details and why you're applying for a blue badge. So like myself, you might say, I have severe osteoarthritis. I'm waiting for a hip replacement and co can no longer walk as far as 50 meters. Uh, the threshold for physical problems with walking is 50 meters. You will then be required to upload any supporting information for your claim. So say like myself, you have a letter from your consultant to your GP saying, Miss Galinsky is waiting for a hip replacement. I have examined her today and she obviously has a lot of pain from that hip and reports that her walking is now very limited. So whatever supporting documentation you have to back up your claim, if your child is autistic, for example, if you have a letter to that effect from their psychiatrist, you will need to upload it in order to support your claim. You can choose not to upload the documents when you're applying, but if you do this, you will need to supply hard copies 
to your local authority. Your application is then referred to your local council for a decision. Now, even though the blue badge scheme is administered centrally, each application is then farmed out to the relevant local authority, and it is they who make the decision. Next slide, please. Your local authority can't start the assessment process until they have all the necessary evidence. So gather it all together before you make your online application so that you know exactly what you've got to send in. It may take 12 weeks or longer to assess your application. You may require a medical assessment if the person looking at your application doesn't think they have enough medical information to make a decision. This will be conducted by the NHS. Face-to-face -face appointments for assessments have been suspended. Instead, you may get a phone call regarding your application, but I did read recently that face-to-face -face assessments are going to be reinstituted, although this may vary from one local council to another. Your claim form will be used as part of the assessment. So it's important that the evidence you put in your claim form and that you send in is consistent with what you tell your assessor if you have one. The person who looks at your form may just decide to give you a blue badge on the basis of your information. So if they do ring you up, or if you do go for a face-to-face -face assessment, remember what you've put in your claim form and don't suddenly start talking about other physical or mental health problems that aren't relevant. A badge will not be issued if eligibility has not been proven. Next slide, please. After your application has been assessed, you will receive a letter detailing the decision that's been taken. If you disagree with this decision, you can appeal it. However, unlike disability benefits, there's no formal appeals process. The decision letter will give you further details on how you can appeal and what the time limit is. This will vary from borough to borough. The decision will be looked at again, and you will then receive another decision letter. As far as I'm aware, there are no face-to-face -face appeals for refusals of blue badges. If the decision remains unchanged, the only recourse open to you legally will be an application for judicial review, which is very expensive. However, you may be able to avail yourself of your local authority's own complaints procedure if you feel you haven't been fairly dealt with. If your condition has worsened since your application has been refused, it would be much easier to just reapply and submit new evidence. <coughs> Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So here are some general tips. Check the eligibility criteria very carefully before you apply. Make sure that you have all the necessary documents ready before you apply, as it could slow things down if you don't have them ready to send in however you choose to send them in. The fee you pay will vary from one council to another, as will the time taken to process your application. Depending on the reason you are applying for a blue badge, you may need to inform DVLA and your insurance company that you have one. For example, if you're partially sighted and are getting one on that basis, you should inform both DVLA and your insurance company. Some local authorities like Haringey, where I live, have what's called a companion badge, which incorporates your vehicle registration number so it can't be used on any other vehicle. 
this is to try to minimise thefts, which are considerable from vehicles showing a blue badge. However, the fly in the ointment is that in order to get a companion badge, you have to pay for it. And it's more expensive to get the companion badge than the blue badge itself. But do be careful to guard against thefts if you can. And lastly, don't be um, ashamed to get help if you need it. These things can seem daunting and complicated. So do ask someone if you think you need help. Next slide, please. So for form filling services, you can visit SCOPE or the CAB or your local council's website, which may have details of local organisations that can help you. Lupus UK has a range of resources available on its website. If you want to read about this or anything else to do with welfare benefits, in my view, the best book is the Child Poverty Action Group Welfare Benefits Handbook, which provides easy to understand information. However, it's very expensive to buy, it's over 50 pounds. Um, as the libraries will hopefully be reopening soon, you, you may want to wait until you can look at it in the library or you may be able to access it online. The gov.uk website has lots of useful information on benefits and eligibility. And lastly, the Disability Law Service provides free advice for disabled people. So that's it. Thank you for listening. And I will now take any questions. So uh, thank you so much for that, Louise. Um, I think it was a very informative presentation as usual. Uh, we'll now just take a quick break. Um, I think about five minutes. So it's now 4.25 if we come back at half past four and then we'll get into the q and I'm sure there are quite a few people that have questions. Um, but yeah, it gives everybody time to use the loo and grab a cup of tea if they want. Okay, see you in five minutes, everyone.
Can't hear you. No. What about now? Yeah, can hear you now. Okay. Wow, technology really just fluffed it. I made a whole speech and everything. Did anyone hear any of that? No? No. Could you do it again? Right. So um, essentially, um, it was based on the slide that I had up. So just asking for feedback. So if, if anybody has attended this session and wants to give us feedback or any of the other sessions and, and would like to give us feedback on how we did, what we can improve, please um, email champreet at Lupus UK. Champreet, if you could kindly put your um, email in the chat box, that would be fantastic. Um, likewise, if you're interested in Chronic Creatives and want to know more about what we do, you can um, follow us at Chronic Creatives on Instagram or email us hello chroniccreatives at gmail.com and I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, so yeah, sorry about that technical difficulty. I had no, I have no idea what happened. Might be because my uh, laptop tried to connect to my headphones. So uh, Louise. Hi. Hi. Uh, let's, let's get into it. How are you feeling? Um, acceptable. Acceptable. Okay. Well, I think a lot of people here today can likely relate to that. Um, so the first question um, is from somebody who just wants to say thank you for the information, um, as well as the information from other disability, disability benefits. Thank you so much for um, saying thank you. That's really appreciated. And the question is, will the presentation be available to you at a later date? Yes, it will. Um, I believe Lupus UK have started to put the sessions on YouTube, hopefully with uh, gaffes like the one I just committed, edited out. Um, <laughs> but yes, they, they will be available either on the Lupus UK website or I believe on YouTube. And there are also slides, these slides um, to download as well from the Lupus UK website. Um, does anyone else have any questions for us? Well, if anyone has a question on anything else mm. that I've covered, then um, you're welcome to ask. If not, I look forward to seeing you all driving around with your blue badges. I got mine in during the first lockdown. And it was remarkably easy because I don't think they had anything to do. They didn't even bother ringing me up. And I was surprised being a bit of a technophobe at how easy it was for me to upload things. Um, so I managed to send in uh, all the information that they needed. I was extremely proud of myself for having done so without having to um, seek help from my daughter who is the lovely Zuleika. Um, so yes, and then I got an answer back within 10 days and the badge itself arrived a few days later. So I was very impressed. So if you are thinking of applying, do so now before normal services resume. And I would also say they can't really any longer use the excuse of COVID for being slow and incompetent because we've had this situation for a year now. So it's just the usual reasons for being slow and incompetent, not COVID necessarily. Um, okay, somebody has asked, hi, I can't drive anymore, but can I apply for a badge and put in my old car and, my hus and can my husband drive it with the badge? Yes. With them, with them as passenger. Yes. But uh, so you will nominate your husband to be your a specific driver, but he can only use the badge when you are in the car. Now, this is um, a frequently found criminal offence of people using other people's blue badges when they don't have the problem themselves and are not the person to whom the badge has been issued. Every so often, uh, local authorities do a trawl on checking on people using blue badges. And I remember watching a television program once where they did one of these in Harrow 
and 60% of the people using blue badges on that particular occasion were not the person to whom the badge had been issued and they did not have the badge with the badge owner with them. So all I would say is, if your husband's ever tempted to use the badge on his own, it is a criminal offence and you can be fined up to a thousand pounds. So it's not worth it, although it's not enforced enough, in my opinion, because when I'm trying to park in a disabled bay, there is often an able-bodied person using that because they can't be bothered to park a little further away. So the short answer is yes. Can you nominate more than one person? I'm not sure, maybe the form will tell you. Okay, um, a follow-up question to that, Louise, because I'm, I'm curious. So say for the sake of argument, you're somebody um, who is used to driving somebody uh, who needs the blue badge, who is the blue badge holder, and you just take the car and the blue badge is out and you happen, you know, you're just kind of on autopilot. Well, if you have the bad luck to get stopped, um, you'll be issued, uh, I think there is a spot fine, but if you want to challenge it on the basis that you weren't aware that the blue badge was in the car, then I think you can request um, a hearing in the magistrate's court. Right. So the upshot of it is, is that if, uh, if the badge holder is not in the car, leave the badge with the badge holder. Or, or put it away in the car. Yeah. Right. But don't leave it in the car just in case your car is broken into and the badge is stolen. There is a healthy market for stolen black ba uh, blue badges. And uh, one person I know has had her badge stolen three times. Wow. Wow. But this is because the local authorities don't enforce the system enough. If you knew there was a real risk of being stopped and found out, you wouldn't do this. Mm. But because it's very rarely done, then, you know, there, there is this market for reselling of blue badges. That's awful, considering all the effort it takes to get one in the first place. Well, and also, I mean, when I used to drive my late mother around, she had a blue badge and often we, we weren't able to park in disabled bays because they were being clogged up by people illegally using other people's blue badges. And my mum physically could not walk more than about 10 feet. So it used to make me very, very cross. Mm, I can imagine. Okay, um, are there any more questions? on blue badges or on any of the other benefits that we have covered so far? Give it a bit of time. Awkward silence, awkward silence, awkward silence. Talk amongst yourselves? Yeah. So Lika, did you have any questions personally? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, I, I, oh, okay, there's a follow up. The person thinks, thought that you had to leave the badge on display in the window when you park in a disabled space. Yes, you do. When I'm saying don't leave um, the badge in the car, I mean when you're at home and you're not using the car. So if you've gone to the shops and you've parked in a disabled bay, yes, you do need to display it. But when you come home and are parked in your driveway or outside your house, then you don't need to display it. That is when I meant don't leave it in the car, just in case your car is broken into. Mm. Or in case, uh, somebody else who is who does drive your car winds up driving your car without you in it and then well if the badge they can drive the car mm. without you in it but not displaying the badge yes 
but that's that's what I mean. Say for the sake of argument, you're accidentally displaying the badge and you get caught on one of these random sweeps. It could uh, get complicated. Yeah. Right. Okay. Do we have any more questions? But just a small point, when you park in a disabled bay, you only have to display your actual badge. When you're parking in another place, say in an hourly paid bay or a residence pay bay, if you're allowed to, you also have to display a timer card, which will arrive with your blue badge, which shows how long you've been there because you can't stay more than three hours. So you have to display both of those if you're in a time parking space or a residence bay or on a yellow or double yellow line. If you're in a disabled bay, you only have to display the badge itself. Right, that's very good information to have. So this is very, it's very time sensitive. Yes, it is. Thank you very much for your feedback, Denise, I've just seen in the chat. Um, okay, everybody, uh, I think we're gonna close it down if there are, um, oh, okay, there is another question. If you have automatic entitlement, do you still have to supply additional information? No, if, um, say for the sake of argument, you receive the enhanced rate for mobility for PIP, or the standard rate for moving around, which is 20 to 50 meters. Remember that the threshold for a blue badge is 50 meters, whereas for the enhanced rate for PIP, it's 20. So that's why if you get PIP for not being able to walk more than 50 meters, you can still apply for a blue badge. What you will have to send in is your letter granting you the award of PIP. So if you send that in, you shouldn't have to provide any other information apart from proof of identity, address and all the rest of it. I think it's worth mentioning here or asking the question, Louise, you, when we say send in additional information, we definitely mean scans or photocopies and not originals. Yes, they don't want originals. Um, if they want any more information from you, they will call you. Right, it's, yeah. But I know, I know a couple of people who have fallen afoul of sending in their originals to the council. And, and never to be seen again. They don't get them back. Yeah, so that's a really, you know, it's a really good point, particularly if you're, if you're going to send in additional information to the council. Um, well, it, interestingly enough, this is a side point, I have to renew my driving license on a paper application because the DVLA made a mistake in spelling my name on my last driving license. Instead of putting Louise, they put Laos, which some people might find abusing. So Muggins has to now send in an original birth certificate. Right, which I'm sure is quite expensive. Yes, to get another birth certificate will cost me £20 plus. Mm. So I'm going to ask them to send it back by guaranteed next day delivery, whether they will do or not, um, is another matter. So, you know, one has all these uh, trials with bureaucracy. So yes, never send in original documents if you don't have to. I think that's an excellent, uh, an excellent point to leave it on. Um, unless anybody has any more questions, we do have 14 minutes. Um, but yes, thank you for your feedback as well, Brenda. That's appreciated. Um, we'll give it a, a couple more minutes, but um, I think otherwise we'll be, we'll be closing down the session and thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, I um, hope you helped. You've been helped in some way by what we've shared with you over the last few weeks.
All right, let's leave it there. Thank you all. Um, thank you. Thank you, Louise, so much for being here despite You're welcome. You're in pain. Uh, Champreet, thank you to you and to Lupus UK for working with Chronic Creatives. Um, and yeah, have a good week, everybody, and um, happy Easter if you celebrate, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>